My name is Jim Glidewell and uh, from Boeing, and so I hope you all had a pleasant flight into uh, the Bay Area. <laughs> um, so my presentation is about uh, our experiences with PBS Pro. Um, uh, my organization has long supported the Boeing commercial aircraft uh, side of the house. I'm happy to see that some of my colleagues um, from here in California also attended. Uh, HPC has tended to grow in Boeing uh, rather organically, and, and we have a wide variety of uh, installations throughout the nation uh, serving different user communities. Again, ours is kind of focused on uh, uh, BCA. So um, what do I want to cover? Um, well, I think I'm just going to touch really briefly on, on why we do HPC. And again, this is somewhat from a, a commercial aircraft point of view. Uh, we'll look at our HPC environment, um, talk a little bit about our configuration and uh, of PBS on that environment. And then we'll talk about how we've extended PBS um, in areas mostly of uh, monitoring and scheduling. Um, and then finally, I'll take a, a, a brief moment to look at a couple of uh, forward-looking projects. So um, why do we do HPC at Boeing? Again, uh, from a BCA point of view. Um, it's really important to be able to communicate to our management why it is that we're putting the kind of investments that we do into HPC. Um, I really think that for, for our uh, BCA customer, there are two major factors. Uh, the first is cost avoidance. Um, building a, a, an object as complicated as a commercial airliner um, requires a lot of design and a lot of testing. And wind tunnel testing is phenomenally expensive. Those in, of you that might be in the auto industry um, probably see a similar thing with crash tests where you think, well, a run up where a, a, a naive person might say, oh, you run run an auto into the wall, shouldn't cost you very much to do the test. That's not the way things are, and that's certainly not the way things are in wind, wind tunnel and um, flight tests. You do spend a whole lot of money um, verifying, setting up, managing data collection, and data analysis. And a, a single wind tunnel test can run, if you try and do the entire uh, flight test envelope can run easily into $10 million. So that's a huge cost. And we've been able, to, over the years, with our BCA customer, to drive the number of wind tunnel tests down as part of design from on the order of a dozen or so during the, the program down to well under half a dozen, uh, usually just three or four. And those tests are typically more validation tests to verify to see if the results that they've already got are valid versus uh, doing it early in the design where they're actually having to build whole new models in order to uh, test in the wind tunnel. But honestly, that's not the, the big savings. The big savings is in, in, and the big payoff is in the long term. Um, building commercial aircraft um, has a very specific customer base and airlines are very sensitive to their operational costs. Uh, being able to shave just a, a single percent off of drag off the plane can result in fuel savings and millions of dollars over the life of that plane, plane service. And, and this turns directly into our ability to sell that product at a higher price than we would be able to otherwise. And so uh, I really believe, especially from the commercial airplane side, that, that, that Boeing and its other competitors in the space um, get more bang for their buck out of HPC than just about anybody. So how do we deliver this sort of uh, resources? Well, we've recently done a, a complete refresh of our environment. Um, we've gone over to uh, a number of uh, HP-based clusters. Uh, you see one of these illustrated here. Um, InfiniBand Interconnect, uh, there's 12 cores per, per blade, and uh, PDR InfiniBand Interconnect. A, a big part of our, our success is, is storage as well. I think this is one of the areas where we really underestimated the need for, um, for high-performance storage when we first started in the cluster uh, environment. Uh, we learned our lesson pretty quick on that. Um, we use Panassis as our primary storage. Um, it has some very interesting characteristics with regard to 
um, scalability and uh, parallel performance, and uh, it served us pretty well. So how do we tie these things together? We use kind of two interconnects. Um, on the top you see uh, the yellow is InfiniBand. You see some very nice wire work in the upper center there, um, courtesy of our Boeing uh, cable and wire guy. Um, so basically the, the flow is from our cluster on the upper left. Yeah, I can do that. Um, through the cabling to a, a, a large InfiniBand switch. Um, out the bottom is, is gigabit ethernet and 10 gigabit ethernet, um, not shown in this reaching to our stores, uh, not shown here is the bridge device that uh, serves as a bridge between InfiniBand and ethernet. Uh, here's kind of a traditional block diagram on the right in the round corner rectangle. You see our cluster, all the nodes are connected through InfiniBand and, um, and that's where all the MCI traffic goes. Down at the bottom in pink is the, the InfiniBand to uh, Ethernet bridge. We have a large private network consisting of multiple 10 gig E connections um, connecting to the storage. Um, in general, our scratch storage is just accessible to the cluster. The permanent storage is available um, to the main Boeing internet, which is up at the top. Um, the one other component are the things marked RGS. Um, this is a similar concept to something that was mentioned earlier, the display. Um, oh, I don't know all the products. Uh, anyway, uh, these, are, these are also post-processing sort of nodes, either running Citrix or um, HP's RGS on Linux. And those let users do gridding or pre- and post-processing. Um, inside the data center with access to uh, the storage, pre preventing uh, them from having to move it uh, long distances to their desktop. Okay, there we go. So, um, PBS, uh, one of the things we do is, is we have multiple clusters and we keep them independent. Um, we don't try and bring, when we bring in additional computing resources, we typically don't try and attach it to an existing head node, an existing cluster instead we set it up as a new cluster. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And we use peering to move the data uh, and move the jobs between between those clusters. We use a simple, very simple execution queue structure. Um, we tried to actually hold it to two queues, express and standard, but we found that, um, as was mentioned earlier, large queues, can, large jobs can sometimes lag because um, smaller jobs tend to crowd in ahead of them. And so uh, we have we tend to implement at least one large queue on each uh, complex. Um, one thing we do that I don't know that anyone else does is, is we submit uh, have our users submit to a priority queue rather than to a specific uh, execution queue. The idea is they tell us what priority. This prevents the problem of having them choose. If you ask somebody to choose a priority between zero and a thousand, you know what number they're going to pick. So this, this lets them think a little bit more in terms of just how critical is their turnaround requirement and, um, and submit accordingly. That doesn't mean that most of our work isn't critical, but um, hey, at least it gives them the option. So, uh, and then jobs are moved to the appropriate execution queue. So here's kind of a diagram of, of how we typically set up the, the queues. Um, again, those priority queues at the top, the, the ovals are routing queues. We have the very unima unimaginatively named uh, routing queue in the center there, uh, which is in fact named routing. And then it will either pass the jobs to uh, a local queue or pass them on to another cluster if they have a, are asking for a resource that isn't available. Um, there isn't really much of that sort of traffic to next cluster anymore. Um, we make very heavy use of peering. At one time, uh, we had seven clusters peered together. I don't know if any other sites that use peering as heavily as that. Um, all, in general, all our clusters are peered. Um, and what do I want to say about this? Um, so there are good points and bad points to peering. Um, it, it, probably one of the biggest good points is it makes it really easy to bring in additional resources at the cost of an additional head node. Um, it lets you bring this cluster in, do your testing, let some early beta users on to validate that it's good, and then basically with a flip of a switch, a change to the PBS sched config file, 
um, you can bring that into production and, and general use. Um, so that that's really good. Downsides, um, I guess, it it's not, not it is makes things more complicated. There's no um, central global limits anymore because you do this. I know that Altair has a, a new feature to address this, but we haven't uh, picked up on it yet. Um, it all, likewise, it makes licensing a little bit uh, trickier, license management. And it's not really a, a, a replacement for true uh, failover, but um, when we had seven clusters, it was pretty close because uh, if six of them were still running and one of them was down, we really didn't get much free from our users. So, um, so now I'm going to talk about a couple of things that we did um, specific to try and extend TDS. One of them was this thing called Dynamic TDS Scheduler, which is a really terrible name, as it turns out. Um, it, it isn't really a scheduler. It's more an advisor or a backseat driver. Um, the idea was that, that when you have multiple queues and you have queue limits associated with them, at times those limits will be right, but most of the time they'll actually be wrong. That the, there'll be too much demand in one queue, too little demand in another. Um, the two results are either that you um, have jobs unnecessarily waiting, and kind of as a corollary to that, if you have jobs unnecessarily waiting, you also have resources going unused. So something we really wanted, didn't want to do. So we looked at, at trying to uh, address this, and we came up with this little thing. Um, so here's PBS and a couple of queues, and jobs are being managed, and, and everything's that, you know, being enforced based on static limits. So what we did was we introduced a new daemon, this dynamic TDS scheduler, or non-scheduler, as you may want to call it. And what it does is it basically just periodically pulls TDS using QSAT. That was the easiest way to do it. Um, it consults a, a little guidebook configuration file of what our targets are. Maybe we want to say that the large queue can have anywhere from 10% to 50% of the machine, uh, those sorts of limits. It, it looks at all the jobs that are in the queues, uh, makes its best determination of what it thinks the limit should be, and then feeds that back via queue manager directive uh, to PBS. We actually implemented this fairly early on. We implemented this first on our Cray X1, which is, has been retired for a bit of time now. So this was probably done at least five or six years ago. And we've ended up using it basically on every cluster, at least on one machine in a peer group uh, on every system since then, because it, it really does provide, it lets us do some fencing between the queues, and yet at the same time, uh, doesn't spill resources on the ground. Um, a much more recent uh, project that we've been doing, working on, is, is this PBS license, man HPC license manager. Um, we were never really happy with the license management tools that um, PBS provides. One of the big problems is that in order to enforce a new application license, you generally had to add a new resource, which meant a PBS scheduler restart, and that's something we didn't, we really don't like to do. Um, we take very few outages. So we wanted, well, and the other thing that, that happens within Boeing is, is that the application domain folks and the people who provide the delivery systems are really quite far apart organizationally. And application licensing policies in Boeing are very complicated because the demand can be, the rules can change for every application. You may have a situation where a given organization is paid for a quarter of the licenses and they want to be guaranteed that share of the licenses regardless of where they run. Um, this sort of thing. And, and we really wanted to, that's not the sort of thing that I as a PBS administrator want to be responsible for updating and coding on a, a daily basis. And so we tried to come up with this, this license manager scheme to try and uh, kind of decouple us from that. So here's what you see on, you see a PBS job and, and, and the, the key technology that we used that PBS provided was the run job hook. So we have a hook that that is invoked right at the uh, start of the PBS job. And, and thankfully, I've already had a couple presentations to, to kind of warm people up to this idea. Um, and um, so you have a run job hook, and, you're, and, and that 
examines the job to see if there are any licensed applications in it. And we use the, the tags we used are license and tokens, um, or the two tokens. And those are, are both list operators and, or list resources, and they can be done in pairs. So you can have multiple applications within one job. But what happens is, is that you know the PBS hook is ba run job hook is basically invoked at the very last second before PBS is going to commit to running that job. When that happens, um, we grab that information, check it against config file, and then run a license checker um, that serves as more or less a switchboard to uh, uh, or a router to, to to talk to the specific application uh, license script. Now those license scripts are simply a command line script, so they can be written in any language. Um, we actually took a few hints from Bright on this. Um, we kind of modeled uh, our call and response for those that script against how, how Bright does it. Um, but basically, its input is a command line. Its output is a, a, a string. That's the standard out that says pass or fail, and maybe some supplementary information. So. Um, again, the idea is basically to decouple the license management entirely from the PBS infrastructure. And, and this is work is still actually fairly early in deployment. Um, we're actually going to deploy our first real application, uh, LS Dyna, uh, using this uh, very shortly. We also have interest uh, in a, a couple of other structures code. Um, one thing I'll point out is the reason we did a, a we didn't try and do the license checker uh, program inside the hook is because we wanted to do timeouts and things on application specific license server. And we were really concerned about trying to do timeouts within Python, within a hook. Um, it seemed to be that because the hook is actually kind of running inside the server, at least that's how I view it, um, some of the Python timeout mechanisms seem to be uh, a little dubious um, in, in that sort of environment. And so we wanted to isolate it and, and make sure that we didn't, uh, you know, corrupt P the PBS server as a whole in, in the process of, uh, of trying to check for licenses. So um, moving on, so everybody wants to know what the heck's going on out there. And, you know, there was a PBS mon command, which is great if you happen to be logged into the system and have X windows on your desktop. None of our managers have that. Um, so, so we did some web stuff, and we've been we've been running this for a while now. Um, I'll just kind of flip through the the various things. So, this is the closest analog to X PBS mom. You have a, a bunch of nodes. Uh, blue shows that they're in use. Red or orange shows that they're um, either offline or down, and green shows they're idle. And um, so. And, and, and just like XPBS Mon, you have the option of clicking on any one of these, and it gives you some more details about what's running there and, and the state of things. Uh, similarly, we have something for jobs. Um, in this case, we're looking, in this case, the st status indicators are just red or green. Uh, green indicates that the job looks like it's normal as near as we can tell. Uh, red means it may be problematic. It might not be using as many CPUs as we think it should. Uh, something like that. We try to actually tune these to uh, for individual applications. And so if we're aware that, you know, Abacus tends to use one CPU uh, fairly heavily on the lead node and then doesn't use the other CPUs, um, we, that gets a green. So, um, so and finally, uh, what, what's been happening lately? Here's an example of a load profile. Um, so we see again blue is active, uh, green is idle, and in this case the purple periwinkle-ish color is uh, jobs that are queued uh, waiting to go. And of course the question is, well why do you have jobs waiting in green at the same time? And typical answers are uh, either a user is bumped against the limit uh, for that user or the job just won't fit in the, the remaining space. So uh, both of those can contribute to that. I um, want to talk a little bit about turnaround. Um, so, you know, the really management wants to know about utilization and users want to know about turnaround. And, you know, why isn't my job running? And 
So, and actually management wants to know about turnaround too because they want to know kind of when you've crossed over a threshold and you're going asymptotic on how, how long the wait times are going to be. Um, we really tried to come up with a number that worked in this regard. We looked at, at average wait time. Average wait time is a ratio compared to run time. Um, we bucketed things. Nothing really gave us what we wanted. And so we, we said, well, can't we just kind of look at, get a big picture uh, of how we did this? And so we came up with this red-green chart, turnaround chart. And the idea is that, that basically each job, so, so you start on, on the x-axis as a timeline. Um, each job is a pair of rectangles, one red, one green, with red representing the wait time and green representing uh, the actual useful run time. And then the height of the thing is, is um, on our system we usually count things in nodes rather than uh, CPUs, um, but either nodes or CPUs. That, so it's how wide the job is. So we're, we're looking at kind of how long and how wide and, and how much time it's spent waiting. So um, the key thing about these charts is when we're trying to put all these jobs, I mean, these, there's a lot of jobs that run through our systems. And trying to jam them all onto one page is kind of a challenge. And so the one thing that's really important when you look at these is to say, is to note that where they are up and down on a vertical axis doesn't mean anything at all. We're just trying to get them on the timeline and get them on the page. So what the heck does that look like? Well, it ends up looking like something like this. This is a simple one, by the way. This is um, the, la the last January of production of our Cray X1. And I, I picked it because I think it has some really interesting um, characteristics. Now, you might first look at this and go, uh, it's uh, uh, just a, ma uh, a mash of things. But there's some, some interesting things to call out. One thing that's really interesting is here we are at Boeing, and we have Christmas, Christmas to New Year's off. But people jam the queues before they leave for the holidays because nobody else is going to do it, so they'll be able to get a lot of work done. So you see we had a huge amount of workload coming in on New Year's Day, and they finish the first week, and you see the things have gone idle. Um, again, that's something that we don't really see on, on the charts these days. The other thing that, a couple other things that jump out at this chart. One is well, we've got some jobs that have a huge amount of wait time and almost no run time. Um, we really want to, those are guys we want to go talk to, or at least look at the jobs and really understand what it is that, that caused them to wait that long. Was it something that they did, or is it something we did? And, and so those would, be, those would be things I typically follow up on. Uh, on the other hand, there's this, this tower over here at the, right here. And there's a case where we have a lot of small jobs that if we were looking at summary data, we'd be saying, oh, we've got some kind of problem here because 16 CPU jobs seem to be waiting a long time. And why would that be? Well, when you look at this chart, the answer is obvious. Somebody submitted just a boatload of these things uh, all at one time. It's almost certainly a single user. And so basically, that's data that we can just say, throw away and say, this is, you know, what can we do? Users will do this sort of thing. And, and the system was really doing the right thing not letting one user completely flood it, and, um, and so we throttled it. So um, these charts had kind of fallen into uh, disuse in, in our environment, but um, what we're finding is that we're getting new customers, and, and we've, we've set up a new data center in the Southwest. Um, we have brand new customers that have never dealt with us before. They're asking a lot more turnaround questions than our, our previous uh, customer set. And so we're looking at trying to tune these charts and, and do some more filtration so that when a user calls up and says, you know, my job, you know, you guys want to turn to my work around, we'll be able to look at their jobs in particular and, and generate a chart just for them personally where, so we can have a conversation about turnaround and, and what's reasonable and what's not. Um, so, um, there's a great presentation already this morning on hooks. Um, I guess I'm not going to talk about the hooks that we've developed in any detail. Um, yeah, they're very powerful. Um, they're also a bit of a challenge. Um, trying to figure out what the PBS object model is. Um, in my case, I was a, a, a neophyte Python programmer approaching this. 
so I was actually working even even more in the hole. Um, but it, it is very hard to successfully write a hook the very first time, and so um, you know certainly this is an area where I think we could uh, see some improvement. Um, so we've done a bunch of things. I thought it was interesting. Um, e no e cores. Um, we did the same thing for nodes. So uh, this is another case where, to me, it's really we're working around a deficiency in, in CBS, is that we don't really have good queue limits anymore. Uh, ever since we left uh, nodes behind and started scheduling based on select, we kind of lost a, a very useful course mechanism of apportioning resources by queue. And I don't think we've ever gotten that back. And so what we did was we created this, these pseudo nodes just so that we could count nodes, just so we could enforce limits on queues. This is obviously something I don't think that every uh, site should be reinventing. And so, um, you know, we have been in conversations with Bill and with other folks on the development team to try and uh, come up with some solution that, that addresses a broad variety of this the need for this sort of thing. Um, uh, are there any other hooks that I really want to mention? Well, again, we, we use hooks for the license manager. We also do want a job submission just to make sure that the, the licenses that they're asking for actually exist. Um, we don't want them to wait a week to find out that uh, it's not going to go. Bright cluster manager. I don't think I really need to talk about this at this point. Robert gave an excellent overview. Um, we don't use all of the features all the interactions. Uh, we don't really have Bright manage our queues in any way. Um, one thing that we do use quite heavily is um, the, the health check hooks. And um, this has really made a huge difference for us um, in terms of uh, making sure that we avoid black holes and we have healthy nodes for the jobs to run on. Bright will do, do both periodic checking health checking as well as health checking at the start of every job, and we do both. Um, we do things down to checking uh, uh, firmware revisions on ID boards and things like that, just because it's easy to do, it's very fast, and we can do it. And this, this has already caught situations where this HP as a service provider has come in, swap the board, and uh, swap the blade, rather, and um, got the wrong firmware on it. And this could have caused us a, a whole bunch of grief uh, trying to track down which jobs might have been affected. Instead, we have a situation where the node is immediately, the first job that tries to use it, uh, it trips and offlines the node and we are clear to, to, uh, to deal with it as we uh, see fit and at our own schedule. So, um, Compute Manager. This is... Um, Something that's pretty new to us. It's actually a pretty new product, so it's not surprising. Um, we have folks on the East Coast that have been using uh, Compute Manager for a while now. Uh, they're kind of serving as our pilot effort. Um, we're, um, at this point, we're really focused on structures apps because that's where uh, the need seems to be greatest. The, the challenge is that we've got a lot of engineers coming into Boeing who have never use the command line in their life. And, you know, as much as I can sit and poo-poo that state of affairs, that, that really is the reality. And so um, Compute Manager gives us some tools to very easily um, let those guys point and click if, as long as their, their data sets and things fit into a kind of a standard uh, analysis job model. So I, I always take the opportunity to, to provide some feedback to vendors when I get a chance. Um, and so there's a few things that I, I think I'd, I want to mention here. These aren't in any priority order or anything else. In fact, they're definitely not in priority order by my way of thinking. Um, hardening PBS mom against uh, errant jobs is really an important thing. It's always been a downfall user jobs will do all kinds of stupid things. They will uh, do a shell loop that um, does a local, uh, you know, that basically runs you out of the process table. They'll run you out of memory. They'll do intense I.O. 
They'll do a bunch of things that'll block PBS Mom from completing its mission of reporting in its that things are okay uh, to the to the server itself. Um, one thing that we could, you know, and, and there's been a huge amount of progress in this area, uh, and and we really do appreciate uh, Altair's uh, gracious acceptance of some of the suggestions we made. Um, one of the suggestions, though, that I think would do be really good is is control groups. Um, control groups are roughly analogous to uh, CPU sets on SGI systems. Um, these are, provide a mechanism for uh, partitioning a single node. Um, and we see more and more need to uh, run multiple jobs on a node. Uh, this is kind of a change from as, as our customer base has evolved. Um, so uh, control groups provide a fairly hard partition between uh, CPUs, memory, and, and multiple jobs on a given node. This would be one thing that would, I think would be a really uh, huge benefit to uh, hardening the PBS mod. Um, there's a very good priority uh, calculation function put in. I, again, I think uh, partly uh, due to Boeing's and other customers' requests to be able to calculate priorities on the fly. But one of the things that there isn't is a way to, uh, to say, hey, if it's below this priority, I don't want this job to run. There's no built-in threshold. There, there are certain kinds of work that we want to hold to the evenings or the weekends. We want to be able to do it via a very simple computation. We don't want to do it through some other mechanism. Um, so that, 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 I think, would be a great uh, improvement for us. Um, improved handling of multi-home posts. Um, Things have progressed quite a ways from um, early days of, of computing where you had maybe maybe one, maybe two uh, Ethernet addresses for your machine. We have multiple networks for both InfiniBand. We have multiple networks running on InfiniBand. We have uh, administrative Ethernet networks. We have public networks. We have a huge number of networks feeding into the, the PBS head node. Um, this has caused a lot of confusion about what machine am I when PBS tries to resolve its, its host name. Um, this is another area where we've been having active communication with uh, the development staff and, and support staff of Altair. And I think this is a problem that's going to grow for everybody. Our environment is very complicated, but I think this is going to be more the norm uh, throughout your user base. Um, do want to see some minor improvements in, in Bright and PBS Pro integration. Bright uh, works pretty well for us, um, but like PBS, it's very persnickety about host name resolution. And um, because it defines networks, um, there needs to be a little better coordination there. There's a couple other rough points, but um, we're interested in seeing Bright and uh, Altair work together on that. Uh, parallel prologue and epilogue. Bill, is that there yet? Okay, well, that's good. Um, so, um, and as I mentioned, uh, queue limits are, um, have kind of gone away in, with, with chunks and select equals as the resource mechanism. We really want a, 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 a queue limits that work. And I think that's another thing where we've communicated our our interest to uh, Altair. Um, finally, a couple of other things. Um, as I mentioned, hooks are, are difficult to develop for. Um, it's really hard to understand the object model is probably the biggest thing. The other thing is there's really no test bench to put it on unless you have a test machine that you can run this stuff. I guess with VMs, you kind of can, but um, I don't know. I, I'd like to see a, a a better solution uh, in that area. Compute Manager has a lot of promise to make things very easy for the end user. It unfortunately makes things very complicated for the administrator. I, we've gotten a lot of support on Compute Manager from Altair as we moved into kind of a, a pilot mode, um, but it really scares me in terms of, uh, it really requires a very skilled administrator to build an application de de definition and, and implement it effectively. Um, so 
finally, one of my favorite things is documentation. I, you know, I, I really do have a lot of respect for the Altair documentation, but I like lightweight stuff. I love how-tos. I like two or three page documents on how to make things work. Um, and uh, finally, I really do want to see an active user community. Altair actually put out discussion groups. They built an online presence. It looked like it worked for a while, and then it kind of just faded out. I've got an RSS feed that I monitor, and it is very, very, very quiet. Um, the infrastructure is there. It's really up to us to, to make that happen. So I'm really glad that PBS, uh, that Altair has, has hosted this user group, and I hope that this will kind of kickstart uh, more sh active sharing between uh, various sites. And with that, um, that's all I got. Okay. Thank you very much. If there's